Hey, placemakers, Rob Tullis here with a series of five short videos dealing with placemaking technique. I hope you've already watched my series of four one-hour lectures on placemaking available here on my YouTube channel. If so, you know that I'm preaching that architects and urban designers should put place before project, that they should be conscious of the spaces between urban buildings as a setting for human events, and that their building designs can help define these spaces and enhance the sense of place felt in them. But you may be asking how. How are designers to put place before a project in order to help transform space into place? So I've put together these five talks, which are excerpts from some other longer lectures that I've given, dealing with a couple of techniques. In talks two and three, I'll demonstrate a technique for planning the spaces between urban buildings by looking at precedence as a referential point of departure. In talks four and five, I'll demonstrate a technique for using mannerism in designing the building facades that face those spaces. And here in talk one, I'll give a brief introduction to set those techniques and my use of them in context. So let's get into that now. The first element of context is the fact that I grew up in New England. This is an old section of the US and we have lots of old buildings. My first architectural design, a high school senior project, was in addition to a 1740s house. My first architectural job was for an antiquarian architect in a colonial town. In my second job, I wrote a guide to the historic architecture of New London, Connecticut, and helped restore an entire street of Greek revival houses there. So I've measured a lot of existing conditions in my time. And I live and work in Boston, a city with lots of old streets and squares, and a development pattern founded on successive generations of expansion into distinctive districts built on areas of filled land. Like the old joke about the newcomer asking where Boston women buy their hats and being told that Boston women have their hats, we already have our buildings in urban patterns, and they're delightfully quirky. So my worldview is distilled in an environment in which existing context shapes the appropriate architectural response when designing new buildings and spaces. The second element of context is setting these techniques in the context of my education and influences. I got my Master's of Architecture at the Harvard GSD in the early 1980s, where I was taught by, among others, Fred Coder. I later worked for Fred and his partner wife, Susie Kim, at their firm in Boston. As I pointed out in my one-hour lecture on placemaking thought, Fred Coder was a student of Colin Rose and Colin's author, when Colin's co-author of the book Collage City. Rose, Rowe advocated a speculative and at the time avant-garde view of architectural history, comparison, and analysis. He looked at architectural artifacts, buildings, and spaces in cities in a simultaneous, non-linear, non-chronological way. Rowe, by the way, was a student of Rudolf Wittkovers, who wrote Architectural Principles in the Age of Humanism. Wittkovers' rational and analytic study of Renaissance architecture proposed that its rules of proportion and composition may produce visual harmony through the use of musical harmonic proportions. Wittkover, in turn, was a student of Heinrich Wolflin. Wolflin was an early art history pioneer no, known for formal analysis and the comparative method. Not only did he pioneer the showing of side-by-side -side slide images in comparison, but he also developed five comparative art concepts linear versus painterly, plane versus recession, closed form versus open form, multiplicity versus unity, and absolute cl clarity versus relative clarity. Now, I am not claiming any special spot in this lineage from Wolflin to Wittkover to Rowe to Coder, but I am now realizing late in my career the influence that this line of thinking has had on my approach to design problems, so at least you know where I'm coming from. From living and working in an old city, I've learned to use history in the analysis of places, understanding the topographic, social, economic, governmental, and design forces that may have shaped it, and to look for clues that might be on site. I show you two well-known examples here. On the left, you see that Piazza Navona's distinctive shape is due to the fact that its medieval and Renaissance buildings were built on the foundations of the ancient Roman stadium of Domitian. And on the right, the shape of the famous Las Ramblas Street in Barcelona that subtly meanders and widens as it slopes downhill towards the city's harbor should be a big clue that it was built on the site of a filled river. 
And from Rowan Coder, I've also learned to use history in a speculative way, as a possible yardstick for su successful placemaking. In the book Collage City, Rowan Coder proposed an alternative method of urban design using typological fragments of city plans, well-known and time-tested examples of edges, focal points, paths, portals, and places overlaid onto urban design problems to help develop and test solutions. This speculative approach to urban intervention is shown here in a figure ground sketch that Roe made while working on his team's entry into 1978's Roma Interrata competition. You can see that he's testing the possibility of a, distinctly, a distinctively shaped public realm by inserting a series of figural spaces derived from historical precedents. I'll use this technique in talks two and three of this series when I propose possible improvements to Boston's City Hall Plaza and Boston's Creek Square. The notion of typology not only applies to the spaces within a city, it also applies to the solids, the buildings. In typology, buildings within the city fabric are abstracted to become formal elements that fulfill a certain role or achieve a certain purpose in urban space. They become types. These types are devices or tools in an urban design, almost like chess pieces, that each move in a distinct way according to rules. And in Rowan Coder's theory, they are assembled or reassembled in the manner of a collage to form new and distinctive districts and places. If urban design technique is to use figure ground studies to test distinct spaces within the city's fabric or its boche, and then to use typological building forms as set pieces to shape and define those spaces, then it's no stretch to think that the features of those buildings can also come from a manipulation of familiar and meaningful architectural elements, elements such as walls, columns, piers, windows, doors, stairs, and the like. So at the scale of the individual building itself and the composition of its facades, typology morphs into mannerism. Architectural mannerism is the manipulation of expected and normal architectural features in a way that produces compositional tension that emphasizes solid and spatial relationships and that draws attention to the variation in the way that the elements are used. And I'll use this technique in talks four and five of this series when I show how three buildings, numbers 38, 64, and 88 Sydney Street, were designed to define and address major public open spaces at University Park at MIT, the development in which they were built. I'll detour for a moment from using mannerism in pursuit of urban space shaping with what I think is a fun illustration, and also to further set the context for talks four and five. In 1950, Colin Rowe published an article called Mannerism and Modern Architecture. It was republished in his book, The Mathematics of the Ideal Villa, in 1976, where it got lots of attention. In it, Rowe speculated that in Le Corbusier's 1916 Villa Schwab, there was so much unusual composition, and the use of the blank panel was so abnormal that it might represent a mannerist approach to facade making, and that there must be an Italian Renaissance prototype. He finds it in Palladio's 1559 Casa Cogiolo in Vicenza. The similarities between the two facades cannot be denied. Rowe then goes on a 15-page speculation of how a, moder a mannerist approach might have been employed in the early days of modernism, or how it might now be employed in contemporary architecture to achieve effects similar to those it achieved in the High Renaissance. So here I show you how, in 1983, Coder Kim took up the gauntlet cast down by Rowe and merged a fascination with the blank panel and modern manner mannerism into their Hastings Tapley building in Cambridge, Mass. I love this example as it shows architects enjoying an inside joke. So since I've grounded this introduction in the theories and techniques of Rowan Coder, and since I worked for Fred and Susie at Coder Kim Associates in the mid-1980s, let me show you some of their architecture from that time as examples of how they manipulated building forms and facades to shape and directly address a particular exterior space. Here at the Codex headquarters, they rotate out a piece of the building and its associated terraces, curving its edge to directly embrace an existing horse track and to give that horse track architectural definition. At the Syracuse Science and Technology Center, they bend the building to both front the street and to create a quadrangle, 
leaving clues for the next architect to use when adding what is assumed to be the quad's third side. Note the use of the grand order of piers to march along the street and the use of the curved facade to form the centralizing focal point at the head of the quadrangle and to imply an axis around which to organize future buildings and relate to the building across the street. At Princeton's Wilson College, they wonderfully combined the fact of two donors and a two-level grade change at an ill-defined corner of an existing quad to create a building that faces and redefines two distinct exterior spaces. And they capitalized on the opportunity to link with the university's walkway and arcade system by bringing a pedestrian route right through the building and constructing a, stair, a public stair in the middle of the building along that route. At St. Paul's in Cambridge, they built a choir school whose primary urban job is to create figural space captured between it and the existing church. A pedestrian bridge is used to define two distinct courtyards, and a chapel provides a formal face to the smaller one, reorienting its visual center line and relating it to the public street. Fred sketches in the center of this slide of building as figure versus air as figure tells the whole story of buildings composed to create urban space rather than to appear as program-generated objects isolated in the midst of free space. This focus on using buildings to create and define distinct urban spaces is also evident in Coder Kim's master plan work. One of the best known examples seen here is University Park at MIT, which won a PA award before it was built and a few awards afterwards. The master plan sets up a major and minor axis, a cardo and decumanus, if you will, along which are placed public parks and courtyards of various sizes and orientations. The buildings are all sited to edge these spaces to make their figural space characteristics more evident by making them appear like voids carved from the surrounding district's building mass. The three buildings along Sydney Street that I'll discuss in talks four and five of this series are located here, numbers 38, 64, and 88. So I'll conclude this introductory video with an observation and a plea to architects that are interested in making legible and memorable places within the city. Your buildings should not be isolated objects in free space, and spaces between them should not be formless leftovers incapable of serving as a civic setting for human events. Your buildings should perform the role of both autonomous object and dependent urban texture. Now, go watch talks two, three, four, and five to see how. Thanks.